Um, so since we're running a bit late, I actually won't be bothering you for too long. I just have one slide. <laughs> and I'm kidding, actually. So today we're at the Randomness Summit, and I was told not everyone knew about Girand in detail, so I will still go a little bit into what is Dround. So uh, Dround is an open source software that is meant to be run by a set of independent nodes that will collectly, collectively produce public, verifiable, unbiased randomness. And um, it's quite interesting because it's verifiable. It means you can verify the output of the DRAND beacons have been produced according to the DRAND spec. And um, it allows us also to bind together different entropy sources like uh, Cloudflare is using their lava lamps, uh, Kudlowski Security is using their own Shasha 20 PRNG. Um, don't worry, I'm the one who coded it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, University of Chile is using, you know, the seismic uh, data from Chile and so on to run the DKG. And then once we have a nice, very random group public key, a uh, group secret key, uh, and its corresponding public key, we can verify new beacons, and all new beacons are predetermined by that secret key. And so DRAN has been running actually in production uh, since. 2019, well, not in production in 2019, but it was launched, the Ligo Fontropy in 2019, and the mainnet launch uh, was in 2020. And since then, we had 100% uptime, like Patrick mentioned, and that is pretty good. And so, how Giron actually works uh, is that it's producing BLS signatures. So, BLS signatures are relying on a pairing of two groups, G1 and G2, onto uh, tar target group GT. And the pairing is bilinear, and so we need to have a public key on one of the two groups, and we will be issuing signatures on the other group. So here, if we pick G2, for example, for the public key, uh, we have a random integer that is our secret S. We multiply it with the generator of the group. We got a point on the group G2. That is our public key for the group. And S here is created using distributed key generation, and each node has their own share of the secret, uh, and at no point in time the secret is in memory on any machine, and that works thanks to Pedersen distributed key generation and Lagrange interpolation. Um, then we need to generate signatures, so at each epoch rho, um, we'll have a round number, I don't know, like 10, you know, and we'll be generating a signature for that round number. And so we have a way of mapping the round number onto the group, uh, you know, as a, as a point on the elliptic curve. And then we'll just multiply it with the secret shares of each node, and these are creating partial signatures, the PI. And... Um, the final signature is aggregated using Lagrange uh, interpolation, basically, and um, that works well. And we end up with a value which is equal to the group secret S time the mapped round, so H1 of rho. And that value will be on G1, the, the first group here in my example, because I chose the, the public key on G2 and the signatures on G1. So. Oh, we can do uh, time-lock encryption with it. Um, so time-lock encryption first is just the fact that you want to encrypt a message that you know now um, so that it cannot be decrypted until a given time in the future. Uh, was actually discussed in my talk at Real World Crypto. And since we don't have too much time, I will be skipping a lot of it. Uh, but I quickly, uh, the applications that are quite interesting are the fact we can do sealed big auctions very easily. You bid something, everybody bids something, you encrypt it towards uh, the same value, and at time t, um, everybody can, ev anyone can decrypt all the sealed bids and see which one is winning the, you know, um, the bid. Another uh, pretty cool thing you can do with it is. Uh, issue document with a known embargo period, so th 
think responsible disclosure or if you're a journalist in a country uh, with like you know sensitive material and you're worried about your safety uh, you could be putting out a cipher text as like a dead man switch you know so that all the data will get released in a month or in two months even if you disappear and um, that is quite interesting for yeah these kind of applications uh, another f more funny application, I guess, is the responsible ransomware I mentioned dur during Real World Crypto, where you have a ransomware that is encrypting some, you know, all your files on your computer, and that tells you, hey, you pay now, or you have to pay to wait, I don't know, three months. And um, that is a much nicer way of doing ransomware. So please, if you, you know, develop ransomware, use time lock encryption. Uh, it'd be great. So. Time lock encryption is not exactly new. Uh, I did not cover that too much in my talk, um, but so uh, that's why I'm going through it now. Um, the it, it was first proposed in 1993 by Tim May, the founder of the crypto anarchist movement. And um, what he proposed at the time was a solution based on trusted third parties, um, namely notaries in that case, where you j would just give them the plain text, no encryption, no nothing, and they would just you know, promise not to release it until the time has come. And I mean, I never understood how notaries work, but you basically pay them to do get that kind of things, and it works. Um, that's not great for computer sciences, so we might want more, you know, computer-based solutions. And that's what came next uh, in 1996 when uh, Rivest, Shamir, and Wagner proposed the time lock puzzles, uh, which we've briefly mentioned already in the previous talks. Um, Time lock puzzles are basically proof of work. So you do, you know, iterated square squarings or some difficult computations that take a long time, and that is how you time lock your data by using that, you know, last value as your secret. And that's not great because it, you know, you it's very difficult to predict how algorithms and computer hardware will evolve in the future. So if you encrypt. Uh, like Run Rivers did in 1999, um, plain text that is meant to last 35 years, you might find out that actually in 2019, after only 20 years, somebody developed some FPGA-based implementation and broke it in two months, or somebody has been running it for 3.5 years on their own you know, CPU, and it actually is much faster than what you were thinking in 1999, and so his time lock you know, puzzle is suddenly broken much earlier than expected. And so these proof of work based solutions are not great because of that. Uh, and then there are a ton of other prior art where people propose, you know, to use Bitcoin to do it, uh, propose to use um, commitments and other solutions. And actually, yeah, there is, a, I, th I think, an implementation of the Bitcoin one. I'm not sure anybody ever used it really, but most of them are, you know, not really great for the planet or whatsoever, are using very, like, cutting-edge cryptography nobody wants to use or just not practical. And so nobody really deployed it. And there is another line of prior art, actually, uh, that started with Hewlett Packard in, 20, uh, in 2002, uh, proposing to use IBE to do time lock encryption with a server releasing the decryption keys and so on. Then there is a first paper about using BLS to do time lock encryption in 2004 by Blake and Chan. And in 2006, we have Rabin and Torb that are saying, hey, the notion of time lock has been around for over a decade and nobody has come up with a good solution yet. So here we are going to propose a practical way of doing it. And they are doing so by using a DKG and all the things, you know, kind of, that we have in DRAND. And that is very interesting. And despite that paper, um, nobody implemented it neither. It was never deployed in practice. And so we are in 2020, and there is still no time lock services out there. And that's what we set to solve. So we wanted to propose a service that would allow you to encrypt something towards the future. And we did so using DRAN. So now you have DRAN that is acting as a cryptographic reference clock ticking and we have all the rounds matching a specific time just like the NIST beacons because the time at which we release the rounds is baked in the protocol kinda as long as we have honest nodes um, 
and the rest actually you know it's just math uh, it works it's based on IB so IB it's a the identity based encryption scheme it's from 2001 uh, it's using also BLS 2003 so it's fairly battle tested you know things from the research side it's starting to get deployed in practice and yeah Diron has been running it for years and now we have a time lock uh, system that is based on that and I will be skipping the rest of my slides because it's just detailing what is in our paper on ePrint and you can also watch my talk at Real World Crypto. It's already on YouTube. And uh, you can try it live in your browser if you want by going to the Time Vault, the Diron.love web page. And it's based on our libraries that we've released. We also have a CLI tool. And uh, yeah, um, there are some details that are important to think about, like what, you know, what happens if you, we want to target 10 years, 20 years in the future, it's very difficult to say if there won't be maybe a quantum computer or some, you know, people at the NSA finding a way to break uh, BLS 12381. So it's quite difficult to say. So we would not recommend using it to encrypt data for, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. But you can definitely use it today to encrypt data for the next week, for the next year, uh, for in three seconds, in six seconds, and so on. So it, it's fairly practical, sounds good. And also, um, it's not super clear who will be doing governance because what if the League of Entropy decide to stop? Uh, should we be releasing the key material that would allow anybody to decrypt all future ciphertext or should we destroy it? You know, and that is more of a governance question. Uh, we don't really have the answers yet, but so far, uh, we are not planning on shut shutting down the League of Entropy. And I think the consensus is given we did not provide any information about it if we were to stop it we would just destroy the key material and um, yeah we're always happy to have more companies joining the League of Entropy so if your company is interested in joining the League of Entropy uh, we'd be happy to talk with you it's a minimum amount of commitment it costs maybe I don't know 10 to 20 bucks a month to run zero nodes it's like two vCPU uh, 500 megs of RAM not too big and uh, yeah and we're very interested in universities and Web2 companies uh, joining the league. So yeah, talk to us. And uh, yeah, that's it.